Hi everyone, I'm Daniela Kwiatkowski. And I'm Jack Nancleary. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Multidimensional Assessment of Executive Function Across the Lifespan, From Theory to Practice. And now I'm excited to introduce to you our guest speaker today. Jack A. Naglieri, PhD, is a research professor at the Curry School of Education at the University of Virginia, senior research scientist at the Devereux Center for Resilient Children, and emeritus professor of psychology at George Mason University. He is a fellow of APA Division 15 and 16 and recipient of several awards for his contribution to the field of psychology. Dr. Naglieri is the author or co-author of more than 300 scholarly papers, books, and tests, including the newly re released Cephi Adult. His scholarly research includes investigations related to topics such as intelligence theory and assessment, cognitive interventions, executive function, intellectual disabilities, specific learning disabilities, giftedness, protective factors related to resilience, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. I'll pass it over to you, Dr. Naglieri. Thank you. As we go through today, I will be referring to and showing data from several of the tests and rating scales that I have published over the years. Um, so uh, this page uh, provides that information. And as I mentioned, you can go to my webpage, jacknaglieri.com, and on that webpage I have information about the various topics that I've written on, copies of my research papers, book chapters, um, my PowerPoint presentations that I've given on a variety of topics, including autism or executive function as we're doing today. And you can also uh, email me directly through that website. But let's uh, start to talk about the session today. What exactly is this session about? Today, I'm really excited to speak about this concept of executive function. And in a lot of ways, I think it is among the most important abilities that we have. And in a nutshell, when we talk about executive function today, we'll be talking about it as it relates to the decisions that we make when we choose to achieve a goal. And what makes me so excited about this concept is that we can successfully encourage people to better utilize executive function, and it has a considerable impact on success in academic environments and others. Ultimately, if we improve EF, we really improve a person's functioning in many aspects of life, which is why I like to talk about this workshop. So I like to um, talk about this topic of e EF from multiple perspectives. And I'm going to begin by giving everyone the very big picture here the view that I'll be using as we go through this webinar today is that the frontal lobes and the neurocognitive ability that the frontal lobes provide is the foundation of executive function. And the expression of the frontal lobes can be seen in behaviors that might be related to cognition, like working memory, for example behaviors related to social emotional skills, and academic and job skills. And so this will be the foundation, this will be the superstructure for what we'll do in this hour and a half session. We're going to begin by just getting a big picture about executive function. Then we'll look at behaviors related to executive function and how it can be assessed cognition or intelligence related to executive function and how it can be assessed. Social emotional skills, also a reflection of executive function. And then academic and job performance also have a foundation in the frontal lobes and executive function. And then at the, towards the end, we'll look at research. We'll actually look at research right away, but 
uh, towards the end, we'll look at research across these different areas that nicely ties together um, these different expressions of executive function. And then when we get to the end, we'll talk about, well, how would you manage information from different tools about these different aspects of executive function? Uh, how would you manage them in a comprehensive evaluation? So let's get started and um, begin with just a reminder. I'm sure that everyone is aware of the famous case of Phineas Gage, the person who really got us interested in the front part of the brain. And I'll remind you that for many years, many professionals thought the frontal lobes really were not very important. But of course, Phineas uh, helped us see things uh, very differently. When that rod passed through his head and damaged his frontal lobe, he was changed uh, very dramatically. And the importance, of course, of the frontal lobes is what we're going to be focusing on in on today, especially dorsolateral frontal cortex. So this is where a person creates plans and strategies, makes decisions about how to do things, checks to see if those solutions work or not, come up with new solutions as needed, and, uh, and executive function and the, uh, and the frontal lobes are very, very important whenever we're in an environment that's novel. So just to remind everybody, before the accident, Phineas Gage was described as having a well-balanced mind and seen as a shrewd, smart businessman who could get the get the job done. But afterwards, after his accident and his frontal lobes didn't function well, he couldn't think very, very well, couldn't strategize. He was behaviorally out of control. He couldn't perform his work and he couldn't get along with other people. But in order to really have this discussion, we need to start by asking the answering the very important question, what exactly do we mean by executive function? And of course, if we read the literature, we know that A.R. Luria was one of the first people to actually talk about this concept of executive function. And his student, Nick Goldberg, has provided us with a wonderful collection of books, especially on the frontal lobes. And Nick likes to talk about EF as an orchestra leader. Um, but he has some other ideas that I think are, are particularly important. Now, not just that the frontal lobes um, provide us with complex decision making and stuff, but rather that the frontal lobes make us human and make us so unique as a species on this planet and make every single one of us on this webinar and every single person in the world unique as people. It's that function, it's that relationship between the frontal lobes and the environment in which somebody is, is reared and grows up. So when we talk about executive function, we really are talking about things like leadership, strategizing, paying attention, noticing things, changing things when necessary. And as you'll see when we get towards the end of this session here, sex differences and the importance of social emotional skills. And of course, just general cognitive development and learning. Now, when we talk about executive function or functions, we have to ask this question, should there be a, an S at the end of the word function or not? And when we look at different definitions, we see there's so much uh, inconsistency and there's a lot of abilities or executive functions that people write about, like initiation or working memory, strategy use, self-regulation, and so on. In the chapter that uh, I wrote with some of my colleagues in our handbook of executive function, we found so many definitions. But when you start to step back and look at them as a group, we really have three kind of groups. Some people say that it's executive function is the best description, meaning it's a unidimensional uni concept. Other people say that 
executive function has many, many parts, so it's a multidimensional concept. And then some people say it's a unitary concept, but it has a lot of different parts. In order to get a better understanding of what we should conceptualize this as, in other words, as having many parts or just one, when I wrestled with this question, I decided that the best way to answer it would simply be to use one of our scales that we had developed at the time, the Comprehensive Executive Function Inventory, or CEFI for short, and the adult version of that CEFI called CEFI Adult. Um, the beauty of being uh, a test author, as I am, is we have standardization and validity samples that are large, and standardization samples that, by definition, match the U.S. population, so we can generalize to that population, and we can answer these really critical questions. Now, just to give you a kind of a window of what we're, where we're going next, this is not an esoteric question. If we decide that the answer to the question is multidimensional, then we'll make decisions about if a person has or does not have an executive function disorder based upon any of those parts. If we say the answer is executive function singular, then it's the collection of those, or a total score, so to speak, that we would use to make the decision if they have an executive function difficulty or not. So this is a very important question, and we're going to answer it, I think, um, very definitively with the set of data from the CEFI and the CEF, CEF, uh, data from the CEFI adult. Now, just to tell you a little bit about how we went about conducting um, this research, we created the CEFI and the CEFI adult using many of the kinds of things that people talk about when they talk about executive function. And as this list here, this um, nine areas shows, attention, inhibitory control, planning, emotional regulation, initiating and self-monitoring, flexibility organization, and working memory. So we have this, the, we have written items according to these particular areas. And of course we have all the items as a whole. So what we did was we used our standardization sample. So for the CEFI, that was 1,400 parent raters, 1,400 teacher raters, and 700 self ratings. And the sample represents the U.S. population, so we have the generalizability, very important. We divided that sample into two. The first set of three ex experiments, really, for parents, teachers, and self, so we had those three groups. The first half, we did factor analysis at the item level. And then for the other half of the sample, we did factor analysis at the nine scale level. You could think of those as nine subtests. So we wanted to be sure that the way we were organizing the data didn't influence our results. And what we found is very nicely illustrated here in this, uh, these two slides. So this is six experiments. And across the six experiments, we get the same answer. It's very clear that executive function best described this co collection of items. Now, this is for our children, 5 to 18. And let's look and see what we get. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot that we also did this. We wanted to be sure that gender or race or ethnic group, age or clinical or educational uh, status um, wasn't somehow a confound. And when we looked at the coefficients of congruence across these groups, we find extremely high coefficients. So this means we're getting the same results no matter how we cut the data. Now, with the CEFI adult, we followed the same procedure. We looked at the item level and we looked at this nine scale level for adults who were rated themselves and adults rated by an observer. Uh, so we have another 3,200 people and we got the same result. And again, we looked at the adult consistency by gender, by race, ethnic, uh, 
by age and clinical status got the same kind of findings. So when we look at these data for our individuals aged 5 to 80, with a sample size of nearly 7,000 representing the U.S. population, we see that the concept of executive function is really best represented as a unidimensional concept. Like Nick Goldberg suggested, when we talk about executive function, we're really talking about, as he describes, the orchestra leader. Well, there's a lot of instruments in the orchestra, but the orchestra as a whole is not defined by any one of those instruments. It's defined by the, collect the, the collection of the whole. So when I talk about executive function, I talk about this definition of how you do what you decide to do. That means you start with a goal and you have an intention. And, that, and you might need to gather more information in order to um, make a better decision about what solution to try. And you would select that plan and you'd apply it and you might see if it works or not, change it if you need to. Eventually, you get to where you need to be. And that's really the essence of executive function. It's really about how you do what you decide to do. And that's a very important point when I talk about intervention. I'll be emphasizing that executive function is when the person decides how to do something, not when the person is following a script that someone else wrote for him or her. Now, I want to speak about another really important foundational concept here. And uh, this is also um, something that uh, Nick Goldberg discusses in his book, and, and I discuss with my colleague Tulio Otero in our most recent book uh, on the essentials of CAS2 assessment. And if you look at these two curves here, um, uh, along the horizontal, we move from, over time, a novel task to a well-learned task. And if you notice that the role of executive function is maximized whenever the task is novel. Once the task becomes really well learned, it becomes a skill. You do it without really thinking about it. And because you're doing it without thinking about it, then that by definition means EF doesn't play a role. EF is going to be involved when you are thinking about it. And you might be doing something that you've done many, many times before, but the situation somehow has changed, and now all of a sudden the role of EF is maximized. So this interplay of how much do we use EF and how much do we just do what we do um, is something that's very important in all settings from academic to work um, to life. Now, when we do use uh, EF, of course, that demands initiation and organizing and attending and remembering where we are and flexibility and so on. So all these kinds of aspects of EF that we talk about are certainly part of what we should look at and in a good assessment. But any one of these in and of themselves is not going to be sufficient. Let's talk about behaviors related to executive function. So there are um, a number of rating scales that are available um, to measure executive function. I'm going to um, focus just very briefly on um, the CEFI and the CEFI adult. The main difference between um, these two measures that I've published uh, and others is that it's strength-based. So my concept of executive function is executive function as an ability. So to me, that means the higher the score, the better. And I, and I like to um, express it in a standard score with a mean of 100 and SD of 15, like a typical ability test would be expressed. And so that, that's a, a very important aspect of these. Both of these uh, instruments provide scores across the nine dimensions that I mentioned, um, as well as a, as a total score and some other um, uh, scores like negative, positive impression, and so on. Um, and I want to clarify a question that often comes up. If you say executive function is 
one thing. Why do you have nine scales and nine scores? And how do we use those scores? And to answer that question, I'm actually going to um, show you the very first case that we ever worked on. Um, this was actually a, a case that nicely illustrates how we would analyze the nine scores. If you look down the column that says standard score on the left-hand side, you'll see a 95 for attention and 82 for emotion regulation and so on down, all the way down. And you see that the child's average is 101.7. So we compare each one of those scores on those nine, those nine scores to that 101.7. And we see the attention scores 6.7 points below the youth's average. And that is actually a statistically significant difference. But we don't list it as a weakness because it's clearly in the average range. Whereas the emotion regulation score, 19.7 points below the individual's average, is statistically significant. And because it's so low, it's a 12th percentile, we would call that a weakness. And using similar logic, we have two strengths. Now, the overall score for this person is very average. So we would not say they have an executive function disorder, but they do have a self-regulation problem. And what we found when we worked with this student more is that the student really had anxiety disorder and that emotional regulation was more related to anxiety, not related to executive function. We use these part scores to better understand what the total means. Now, had this person had three or four or five low scores, the total would have been low, and then we would have been able to explain what that total score means according to these specific areas, and of course that leads right to um, intervention. And we have the same system that's used for the CEPHI adult. And so these treatment scales really are about understanding what the total score means. But any one of these in and of themselves is not going to be sufficient. You need a collection of them before the total score is low enough to say that there's an overall executive function it's failure. And just um, very quickly here, we do provide all this kind of information in the automated um, reports. Now, if you're thinking about, OK, how would we address those nine areas? Well, um, for middle school and high schoolers, one solution is this. Uh, this, so this is a curriculum that I actually uh, helped develop with some teachers at an alternative high school near where I live in Fairfax, Virginia, EF in the classroom.net. You can go to this website, and we have lesson plans for every one of the nine areas that are in the CEFI and the CEFI adult. And um, it's all free. The lesson plans, the video links, what you do and how you do it, it's all for free. And I encourage you to take a look at that and uh, try those out. They could be done in small groups if you do small group work. I think they could be even done individually, one-on-one, -on -one, um, and certainly on classroom-wide or um, uh, classroom-wide intervention. Let's take a few more steps then. Let's talk about EF and intelligence. I think that because we say that EF reflects the frontal lobes, we have to consider it as a type of intelligence. Now, this is not consistent with what we've had for 100 years with the Wexler and the Binet and Woodcock Cognitive and uh, all those kind of uh, approaches to uh, measuring and assessing intelligence. But it is very consistent with the, the work that I have done with my colleague Tulio Otero. Um, this chapter in the Handbook of Pediatric Neuropsychology, for example, is a place to go to get more details on exactly why we we feel so strongly that EF is a kind of intelligence if intelligence is redefined in a different way than what we've done before. And I'd encourage you to go on my website and read this book, 100 Years of Intelligence and IQ Testing. And uh, we explain at quite, with considerable detail, the rationale behind 
my statements. But the, the main point um, that I think we need to reflect on whenever we think about how can we measure executive function, um, we need to ask two important questions about any kind of a test we might give or any kind of a rating scale that we might provide. Um, and and when, so, for example, if you, if you give a test question, um, say a vocabulary test on a Wexler, for example, um, and you ask, what does the student have to know to answer the question? Obviously, they have to know the words and in that, in that language. If you give a test and the student doesn't need to know a lot, but they certainly need to think real hard, that could be a task that involves executive function, or it could be a task that involves some other ability. And I'm going to ex explain those two, those two scenarios on in the next few slides. So in order to explain this a little bit more, I'm going to start by bringing us back to my paper with uh, Tulio Otero in, the, in um, Davis's Handbook of Pediatric Neuropsychology, where we talk about the four basic psychological processes that are related to Luria's conceptualization of the functional units of the brain. So in, in non-technical terms, we, we call this theory PASS, which stands for planning attention simultaneous and successive. And we talk about planning and attention, that's really the EF part of all this. But planning is about thinking about thinking, being alert, making decisions, changing as needed, self-monitoring, self-correction. Simultaneous processing is about getting the big picture, like a block design on a WISC or a progressive matrices or a reading comprehension or understanding grammatical statements. And then successive processing is all about sequencing. Sequencing of anything, sequencing of words, sequencing for speech articulation, sequencing when tying his shoes, sequencing when decoding a word, sequencing when doing math. So these four basic psychological processes, um, I think, need to be measured to really understand if a student's low executive functioning on a rating scale is related to neuropsychological finding uh, of brain function, or is it related to environmental issues? Um, and if you want more information, you can look at my cognitive assessment system. And um, in the manual, you'll see the discussion about the executive function scale on the CAS-2, which is a combination of a planning and attention subtests. So um, in, this, in this theory called PASS, we're really taking a neuropsychological approach to defining intelligence. We're not following the army alpha and the army beta, the verbal, nonverbal, quantitative. And we're not looking at theories of intelligence based upon factor analytic results, but rather on brain function. So when we talk about planning, we really are talking about an ability that a person uses to determine, select, and apply efficient solutions to problems. It's the efficiency part that's so very important. And that includes impulse control and self-control. And that's why in our research, children with ADHD do perform poorly on the scale. And we also have an attention scale, which is really defined in a very traditional way in a lot of ways. Um, attention is gonna be required whenever a person needs to focus on one aspect of a stimulus and ignore the distractions in the surrounding area. So when we look at these two together, these are two good examples how we get at executive function on the CAS. The one on the right is the classic Stroop test, and I'm sure you all know how, to, how that works, but you know when you look at the word red that's printed in blue, you want to say red, but you have to say blue. So that's a, a, a wonderful example of a, of a task that has multi-dimensions, need to focus on one, resist responding to the other. And then the one on the left, of course, the traditional trail making used for funnel of executive function assessment for many years. You gotta figure out how do I keep 1A, 2B, 3C, how do I keep this straight as I go through and connect the dots in the alternating 
correct order. Now again, coming back to the lessons on EF in the classroom, uh, we do have a lesson on planning, and I actually want to drill down on this uh, because I think it's quite important to show you some research I've done on planning. Um, this particular lesson that we have, this is the actual lesson plan that a teacher would use. We would talk about the phrase of the week where we would look at the kind of questions that we would ask the students after they view um, a video. This happens to be a video of a flash mob. And uh, these questions designed to stimulate discussion. Because what I love about the EF in the classroom approach is that we don't directly teach these kids, this is what a plan is. This is how you should use it. This is when you should use it. Let's practice it together. Instead, we ask the question, how do you know if a plan is any good? And we get the students to talk about it as a group. And I'll show you some of the things that they said after they watched this flash mob. Some of the things, well, we asked the question, what would you have to do to plan this out? So the student, one of the students said, we had to learn the dance steps. So that means they had to acquire the knowledge. Another student said, well, somebody had to start the dance. OK, that's initiation. And then uh, we asked, well, so what are the parts of a good plan? Well, think of a possible problem that may occur. Of course, that's you know, contingency management, right? And um, organizing the dance. OK, how do you know if a plan is any good? Um, Put it in action, see if it works. OK, well, that's the self-monitoring piece. Um, give, it a, give it a try. And, and what I really like about giving it a try is that means if you don't succeed, you learn from failing. You don't turn around and say, oh, I'm just, I must be dumb or I must be bad because I failed. So that's all part of this rethinking how we think about ourselves. And what should you do if a plan isn't working? Well, fix it is a really good plan, but go home, that's not a good plan, right? But the really interesting question was the next one. How do you use planning in this class? And the student said, we don't. And in fact, that was the case uh, initially because the teacher did all the planning in the class. And as the student said, Mrs. X does all the playing in class, so you don't have to think about it. Well, this teacher was really a, a wonderful teacher. This was an algebra class. And she became the greatest advocate of this method after the first semester that we tried it. Because it turned the class around, engaged the students, because now they were able to talk about all the different ways to do the algebra problems, not just the one way that the teacher may have provided as a possible solution. And that really changed the attitudes towards the class, changed the, the children's performance in the class. And, and that's what EF is all about. It's about thinking about how you do what you decide to do. If you're just following what the teacher do, tells you to do, that's not EF. You're not using your frontal lobes for that. That The teacher is using frontal lobes in that instance. So let's take a few more steps. Um, in our EF in the classroom, the instruction that we, we provide is also augmented by posters and all kinds of signs in the classrooms, in the hall, to get students to be reminded of all the aspects of EF that we talked about, all the nine uh, areas that we talked about um, on the CEFI. Now, um, I want to tell you a little bit more about using, um, about intervention and, and using different approaches for encouraging students to be more strategic and more thoughtful about how they do uh, what they do. And um, to do that, I'm going to start with this, uh, one of the handouts in my Helping Children Learn book which is an encouragement to psychologists and teachers to talk to the students about how they can be more effective and get things done more efficiently. 
I like to couch it within the phrase, think smart and use a plan. And what I've found is when you, when you speak with young adults, uh, the ones we work with at the alternative school are in their 20s, or when you speak with a 10-year-old or even an 8-year-old, when you talk about, or an 80-year-old, when you talk about, well, let's reflect a little bit on how we can do this rather than just do something. It really changes the outcome dramatically, but it demands that person needs to stop and think, okay, what are my options? What am I gonna try? Um, how can I make sure I'm successful? I became interested in this um, in the early 90s and actually developed a, an intervention which I call planning facilitation. And this intervention uh, has been tried in repeated experiments since then. And I just want to share with you the most recent one, which, is at, which was actually the dissertation of one of my students, uh, Dr. Jackie Eisman. And just to give you a little bit of background here, um, Jackie had spent a lot of time with me look, uh, looking at this concept of planning facilitation and the research that I had previously published. And we wanted to take it to the next level and do a randomized control study. And to make it harder for us to show that what we were doing was effective, we went to a special school, private school in the, in the Washington DC area for children with ADHD and LD. And in fact, the students in this study had ADHD and LD. And if you know the research on ADHD, for example, you know that we can get their behaviors under control, but it's really hard to get them improved academically. So anyway, we set up this study using a traditional experimental and comparison group design. And we used mathematics taken from the curriculum, the mathematics that the teachers had already taught. And I created math worksheets. They were actually four pages long. And the math worksheets were created in such a way, I, I wrote a program in Excel so that we could have an infinite number of math worksheets, but the actual problems would be different, but the difficulty would be the same across all the worksheets. So what we did was we worked with the students uh, in half hour or 40 minute blocks of time. And the teachers did all of this uh, intervention. What they did is they would give the kids 10 minutes to do the math worksheets. Then there would be 10 minutes to 10 to 20 minutes of applying this method called planning facilitation, which I'll explain to you in a minute, or normal instruction. And then 10 more minutes of math worksheets. So. Not only are we going to a school with kids who have lots and lots of problems, we're also comparing this approach to encouraging students to better use EF to more math instruction. And we want to see which one's going to work better. Now, what do we mean by this uh, planning facilitation strategy instruction method? Is the teachers simply asked questions like, what was your goal when you did this work? Where did you start? What strategy did you use? And did that strategy help you achieve your goal in some way? What are you going to do next time? And the students then responded as a group. And in my actual paper, I have a longer list of the kinds of things that the students uh, set, like simplify fractions first and uh, all that kind of stuff. But I'll show you some of the ones that I think are kind of uh, particularly interesting. Um, one of the students said, my goal was to do all the easy problems on every page. Well, there's only four easy problems on the whole four pages, so you're not going to improve much. I do all the problems. I know that I check my work. Well, wow, how often do we tell kids, did you check it before you handed it in, right? I do the algebra by figuring out what I can put on the X. Okay, that's good. But I like these last two. I did all the problems in the brain dead zone first and try not to fall asleep. Of course, that's really important. <laughs> but what did we find? What were the results? 
Well, when we looked at pre-post differences on the worksheets taken directly from the curriculum that the students had, what we found were effect sizes for the normal instruction students of 0.6, which is a reasonable effect size. But the students who were given this planning facilitation, which is really about teaching kids to better utilize executive function, they improved quite a lot. And they actually started off lower, slightly lower than the control group. But we didn't stop there. We said, well, what about on standardized achievement tests? So we looked at math fluency effect sizes. Not much different for the normal instruction students, but quite a large difference for those who are taught to think about how they did what they did. But we didn't stop there either. We looked at numerical operations from the Wyatt. We found, again, that when we encourage students to think about how they do what they do, they improved considerably and more than the normal instruction group. Very interestingly, when we look at who benefited the most based upon that PASS profile, what we found is what I found in all of my research in this area, that the students who were lowest improve, in planning improved the most. And really interestingly, a year later, when we went back and again pulled out the scores for the students, we found that the experimental group was still significantly better than the comparison group. And we hadn't seen the kids, we hadn't been there, we hadn't talked to the teachers or anything for that year. And we've used this method in reading, in reading comprehension, for example, and get the same results. So what's really remarkable about this is the implication is we can improve academic performance in the classroom more by teaching the students to think than by, by giving them more instructional time. And that's really a pretty amazing result. And as I've said, we've been doing this research for quite a while and we have had consistency in, in all the previous research, which is on my website if you want to go read it. Now I want to uh, spend a few minutes at this particular point talking about the relationship between EF and specific learning disability eligibility determination. When we've started off, I said that the concept of frontal lobe functioning, the cognitive part that we measure with a direct measure or a performance test or whatever you want to call it. That's the foundational brain-based driver behind behavior and all the aspects that we're going to still talk about today. But if you think about that, what that really means is that we're getting at a disorder in one or more of the basic psychological processes, which of course is the legal definition of a specific learning disability. And so I've been writing about for some time now that um, executive function is a basic psychological process. And it, therefore, if you do get a weakness in EF, that could support SLD eligibility determination. But how would that actually work? And um, the way that it would work would be to use my discrepancy consistency method, which I first published on in uh, 1999 and which is really not a complicated concept. And it's probably best represented in this triangle here um, that to illustrate a few points. So when we're looking to see if a child has a disorder in cognitive processing, what we would, what we would do if we had a low score, say an executive function, that would go in the bottom right-hand side of this triangle. Those scores should be significantly different than other ability, meaning cognitive processing scores, which I'll talk about next, that are good, that are average or higher. And those average or higher scores 
are significantly higher than the poor academics, which appear on the bottom left-hand side of that triangle. But the most important part about this is the consistency between the low academic scores and the low processing scores. It's not a coincidence that children who, or, or adults who have trouble with executive function are gonna have difficulty with certain kinds of academic or job activities. So in school, a, a person with poor EF is gonna have lots of difficulties with written expression, math calculation, uh, lots of reading comprehension. How do you study, being able to study, being prepared for class and all that kind of stuff. The same thing would be true for young adults in college who are poor in executive function. When they get to college, they have trouble managing all the demands of that environment. And the same thing would be true for adults who get on a job where they have to figure out how to achieve the goals that are expected of them. Um, that demands lots and lots of executive function. And that's why some people just don't do very well in jobs where it demands a lot of uh, flexibility and strategizing, self-correction, self-monitoring, um, because they're not that good in executive function. As adults, we might think of them as being rigid or, or um, hard to manage. Now, there are um, a, two abilities that we need to talk about that are not executive function, because everything's not frontal lobes, right? Everything's not EF, but some things are. And the first, as I mentioned before, is simultaneous processing. This is really when you have to think about how things go together. And block design on WISC is a good example. You could call it visual spatial, but it's really not only visual and not only spatial. It also can be auditory verbal with logical grammatical statements, as Luria talked about in his book, Language and Cognition. But if you think about Gestalt psychology, that's simultaneous processing, that's occipital parietal portions of the brain. Um, progressive matrices, knowing the answer to this, which one of the options goes on the question mark, demands that we study the three by three matrix to understand the relationships of the shapes and colors and so on to arrive at the answer. Answer being number three. <laughs> So that's not EF. This is different. It doesn't demand the same kind of uh, thinking as the EF tasks on the CAS. And then finally, successive processing is all about sequencing and sequencing uh, of anything. Sequencing is so very important for early reading, for reading decoding, for tasks like phonological tasks. Um, this is the area where we find for children with dyslexia, especially the uh, children with phonological uh, processing problems. This is the area that it really underlies that processing problem. And then we want to use EF to overcome any neurocognitive processing disorder. That's where we're going with this, right? So if we have a person with good EF, and they're struggling for some reason that's not related to EF, then we have a direction, we have direction of what we wanna, wanna do. And this is one of the cases in my Helping Children Learn book. Of course, that's not really a picture of Ben, but Ben, really uh, a, a very nice young man, really tries hard, um, but really having a lot of problems. When we assessed him, we found that he was really good in EF, he was good in getting the big picture simultaneous processing wise, but he so struggled with sequencing. So his decoding score was really low. His math calculation was really low. Interestingly, when we asked the teacher about how the teacher was teaching a child how to memorize the basic math facts, we found that the teacher was having him memorize five plus six equals 11. And that so demands remembering that sequence which is why when you, when you teach a child five plus six equals 11, and then you ask them what's six plus five, they say, I don't know, right? Because they memorize five plus six. So they memorize a sequence. He couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, so in a case like this, what we wanna do is 
we want to help then first being aware that any time, any kind of a task requires that he put things in order, that it's going to be especially hard, and then that he has to come up with a plan. Think smart and use a plan, figure out how to manage the sequence. And so some of the handouts in the Helping Children Learn book are helpful in this regard, like um, how can you be smarter, think plot, smart, and use a plan, as I just mentioned. And then we would show him handouts like recognizing the sequence and then breaking the sequence down into parts or chunking or segmenting. And those kinds of solutions then are really, really helpful to help the student recognize the problem, help the student not feel overwhelmed, not feel just stupid like they can't be successful, give the student direction in terms of some strategies like these, but encourage the student to develop his or her own strategies. That's really important because remember what I said earlier, executive function is about how you do what you decide to do. That means we want the student to really be deciding about the solutions. We would give the student an example like chunking or segmenting to give the student a starting point. But what we really want that student to do then is to develop their own strategies and notice when they're having difficulty and then do something about it. Okay, so now we have a few moments for a few more questions. Yeah, so we have one more question here. Uh, does the CEFI provide data that would allow IEP case managers to write IEP goals and design intervention programming? Yes, that's really a great question. And really, the, the nine subscores on the CEFI are really designed to give you a better understanding, more specifically, of what's happening with the student. So if the issue is a combination, and it will be a combination of more than one thing, because you're not going to get one score is going to drive the total score that, down that far, then what, what you need to do is look at those various dimensions um, and build those into the IEP and also look more closely at the individual item level, because we do provide a level on... Uh, of analysis even at the item level to determine when particular items are, are, are rated low enough that they warrant um, further attention. And so we would definitely go at that level as well. And it can most definitely become part of the IEP and we can look at progress over time. Okay, let's look at the, the next segment then, which has to do with social emotional skills. So you might remember when we briefly talked about Phineas Cage, we were reminded of how much trouble he had with social context. Um, he was described, and I love John Fleischman's book uh, because he so eloquently describes Phineas as uh, in such detail you can practically see him uh, as you read the book uh, in front of you. But um, uh, he just couldn't get along with people. It wasn't just that he was out of control and used vulgar language uh, of the you know, mid-1800s, um, but that uh, he didn't even notice that he was being rude or offensive to other people. Um, and he would fly off the handle, and, and people just didn't want to be around him, and they actually said he's not Phineas anymore. Uh, he's somebody else. And uh, I love the way um, Nick Goldberg reminds us how the emphasis really on executive function in frontal lobes has been more on cognition than social emotional and how critically important it is that we tie these two together. And that's why I tie them together in this presentation. I think it's so very important that we measure all of these aspects 
to do a good assessment of executive function. That's the goal, right? That's the point here as we move through. And um, I think merging cognition and emotional is critically important for every practitioner because you're not going to just, you know, it's not a good idea just to give a rating scale and then decide that a person has EF problem or not. You really have to look m well beyond that. Um, I would also encourage people to take a look at Steve Pfeiffer's um, books on emotional disorders where he really nicely ties together social, emotional, and um, executive function. And um, to bring out the importance of social, emotional, I, I actually want to show um, a dissertation that was recently done. I was on the committee for a student. Uh, her name is Tiffany Kong. And um, she did something quite remarkable in her study. She wanted to look at the extent to which social emotional skills, you know, what we talk about when we talk about frontal lobes, actually relate to achievement. I think, now my argument is that social emotional skills is just a reflection of the frontal lobes. It's an expression of frontal lobes. It's an expression of this concept we call executive function. And the study that she used had 200, 275-ish of uh, students, all the students had been identified as gifted based upon a verbal, quantitative, nonverbal test. So that's very traditional IQ. The COGAT instrument that they use to measure verbal, quantitative, and nonverbal is really just a group administered Wexler. It comes from the same literature, the Army Alpha and the Army Beta, just like the Otis Lennon did, Otis was one of the people who worked on the uh, alpha and beta, like a lot of other people developed these tools. Anyway, so there's no EF in the Colgate or the Wexler. And so I was really intrigued by this study because I thought the DESA, which is the social emotional scale, was really an EF within a social context. And I thought it would be very strongly correlated um, with achievement. So the DESA is a 72 item rating scale, social emotional skills. And this DESA is built on the, basically on the castle framework for what those social emotional skills um, should be. So we have the COGAT, which is traditional IQ, the DESA with social emotional and um, the SAT norm referenced achievement test. When we looked at just the basic descriptives for the students, on the verbal, the quantitative, and the nonverbal, all the standard scores, mean of 100 and SD of 16, were all in the 120 to 125 range. Their overall COGAT score was 126 or so. The scores on the DESA and the scores on the achievement were considerably lower. They were about 110. But the really interesting part of this was that when we looked at the predictions of achievement, what we found was that the DESA not only correlated higher with achievement than the COGAT, but in a hierarchical regression, we found that the COGAT did not even enter into the prediction equation and that all you really needed was the DESA to predict achievement. That speaks to the power of executive function, in this case expressed as social emotional skills. And if you want to have more information about interventions related to those uh, social emotional skills, you can go to these two sites, um, the Devereaux and Apperson sites. And there's considerable information about uh, interventions. All right. so. When we say that social emotional skills are a result of EF and what the person has learned, and um, I think that's really, it's really important to just be clear that we learn social emotional skills, um, but it's still, it's an interaction of who we are as people from a neuropsychological perspective and what our environment uh, teaches us. Okay, so now next, I want to spend a little bit of time
about talking about executive function and academic and job performance. I've been writing about this connection between basic psychological processes and academic performance for a really long time. And I've been um, very happy to see some new kinds of measures of achievement that have been pu recently published. And if we, the closer we can get these two together, the better decisions we can make about the extent to which a child's reading problem is related to executive function problem. And I'll just use this as an example. This happens to be um, a, a reading comprehension test that's part of a test called the Pfeiffer Assessment of Reading. And when we put together a measure of executive function and then we look at its possible impact on academics, um, in this particular kind of a subtest, um, we can get at the extent to which a student is using a strategy when they're doing reading comprehension, which of course is a good thing to do in the first place when you're doing reading comprehension. But this particular instrument allows us to look at that more directly. And the same thing with uh, Steve Pfeiffer's measurement of math, where I, I really like this approach because it's not so much about um, can you do the mathematics, but can you figure out how you have to do what you want to do? And that's what EF is all about. That's what we've, I've been talking about all this time, is EF is about figuring out how you're going to do what it is you need to do. EF is so strongly related not just to academics in, in elementary school, it obviously highly related to academics in all of school and in all of life, academic and jobs, for sure. So anyway, um, I really like this approach to understanding performance. And how it all fits together, then, is when we start to look at a cognitive weakness in executive function, especially if you have a disorder in one or more basic psychological processes, which was we talked about earlier, EF on the on a test like the CAS or some other test, um, when we have this connectivity to a specific academic skill, like sight, read fluency, or word recall, and we connect these two in this triangle that I talked about, so where we would have a poor EF score, poor reading comprehension, and yet we have good scores in areas that are not EF. So in a case like this, good simultaneous and successive scores, poor executive function score, poor CEFI score, poor observations in the classroom, seeing the student as impulsive and, and disorganized and so on and so forth. And we see poor reading comprehension. Of course, we would likely see poor math, specific kinds of math as well, especially math computation, math, math calculation. Then we start to see that we have a student with an executive function learning disability. We don't usually think about a learning disability from an executive function perspective, but we should because executive function is a disorder in one or more basic psychological processes. And of course, this has implications for what happens in special ed because that means teachers need to understand what executive function is and how to encourage it not to directly teach it. In other words, not to be the executive, not to be the frontal lobes of the students, which of course, happens too often. And we have suggestions in the various um, chapters and books that Steve and I have written about what would happen next. So now we have uh, time for another uh, question. Yes. So how much does EF affect academic performance in college students? Well, most definitely um, not only in college students, but grad school as well. Because if you think about it, it's kind of interesting. In, in elementary school, things are pretty structured. Get to middle school, it gets a little bit less structured, more responsibility to the student. College, a lot more responsibility to the student, right? They go away to college, the parents aren't around, all that kind of stuff. And then you get to grad school and your professor says, well, now you have to figure out what question you want to answer and how you're going to answer it and make sure you do it well so you get your doctorate. You know, we have this kind of continuum where the higher you go, 
the more EF is required. And so it's almost like the system um, uh, isn't really preparing us for that ultimate goal. It's really preparing us um, more for the intermediate goal or the even beginner goal of do it this way and you'll get the, the grade that you want. And uh, I can tell you from being a, a professor for you know, 30 years teaching grad students, when you tell them, you have to figure it out, it makes them anxious because we're not used to that. Uh, so it, EF is a critical part, certainly of college and, uh, and of life. Let's take a few more steps so we stay on, on track here. Um, I just want to share a few slides about research and then, and then we'll be done for the day. Starting off with the relationship between EF behaviors, the WISC-4, EF as measured on the CAS, and achievement. This is a study that we published in our, in our manual. And I'll just step through it here with uh, working from the bottom up. If you look at the bottom here, you see that the CEPI full scale correlates very nicely with achievement. Now, this is not a huge sample, um, but it's a, a, a sizable enough sample. All these students had issues, academic and such. Um, so CEPI is strongly related to achievement. When you look at the WISC and the CEPI, you see it's the WISC verbal scale that correlates with achievement. Well, that makes perfect sense to me because the WISC verbal scale is just an achievement test because you have information, similarities, arithmetic. That's all knowledge. And I've, I've never agreed that the verbal scale is really verbal intelligence. It's simply a, no, a knowledge-based collection of questions which makes sense why the CEPI would correlate it with it because it correlates with achievement, and yet the CEPI correlates nicely with the planning part of the, of the CAS. Um, when we look at research on the relationship between executive function and achievement in general, using executive function from the CAS, we see for a sample of nearly 1,600 children that we get a, a very substantial correlation that's consistently consistent across the five to 17 year old range. And really interestingly, um, in the paper that I published in the journal of Ed Psych with my colleague, Johannes Rohan, when you use a multiple regression and you put in simultaneous and successive processing first, executive function always adds to the prediction of achievement. And you always get your best relationship to achievement which turns out to be about 0.72, actually, higher than any other instrument that there is. Um, if you take out any one of those, then the prediction, the prediction to achievement goes down significantly. So this aspect, this piece of the past theory is so very important. For prediction achievement statistically just means better understanding the student. And once we understand the student better, then we can make better decisions about what to do with them, how to help them. Sex differences research is also um, fascinating with these various instruments. So on the CEPI, what we find are girls are better than boys, as rated by parents. And this is across three age groups, very consistent. And are by teachers. Girls are better than boys. If we're saying that CEPI and CAS and NADESA all reflect EF, we would expect the same kind of gender differences on all three of these different approaches. And that's what we're going to look at next. So we see girls are better than boys on the CEPI. On cognitive assessment system, when we look at the EF portion, girls are better than boys in actual ability, in their actual performance on tasks that get at planning attention. And then when we look at the DESA, social emotional skills, now this is a T-score here, um, mean, of 100, mean of 50, SD of 10, higher is better. Again, girls are better than boys. So we see this consistent finding across these different instruments because they're really, the foundation is really um, what we're 
most concerned about here, and that is this idea of executive function, frontal lobe functioning. So I want to, um, I just two, two more slides, and um, help people think this through in terms of how do you manage this? I'm talking about a multidimensional approach to executive function. What exactly does that mean? That means if there is, I would describe it a neurocognitive explanation. In other words, an explanation related to the frontal lobes, you should see low ability on an EF scale like the CAS2, low scores on the behavior rating scale of EF, if low means bad. Some behavior rating scales are configured high means bad, right? So, but conceptually, poor performance on EF as a neurocognitive ability, poor performance on behavior rating scale, poor performance on a social emotional rating, and poor performance on academics, but specific academics, right? Because it's not going to be all academics are not going to be so tied to EF. Only those that really require thinking about how you're doing it, like the math calculation, like the reading comprehension, and so on. If you only have a weakness in the behavior, the social, emotional, and academics, let's just say all three of those, but the ability part is normal, then I think you have really an environmentally determined situation. I would not call that an executive function failure because I think the key to executive function failure is this neurocognitive weakness related to frontal lobes because that's where EF is all about. It's about the frontal lobes. And if we're going to be true to that, then we always have to have that evidence. So assessment of EF should be comprehensive. It should include cognition, behavior, social emotional included in the behavior side, and academic skills. We can encourage students to use EF. It's not direct instruction. It's encouraging instead. And that's really how we can help kids think smarter. And it's a very optimistic perspective. And it's not just for kids. And it's not just for adults. It's for older adults as well. Once again, we'd like to thank APA for hosting this webinar. And a special thank you to Dr. Naglieri for uh, being our guest speaker today.